Welcome, everyone. This is Paula Bartholomew, school director here at Hawthorne University. And I'm very excited to have you with us tonight. This does commence our fall webinar series. And we have a very important topic tonight to start off our series. I think it's very relevant. In this presentation, Dr. Liz Lipsky will share her expertise on the topic of digestive wellness. And we'll be talking about the brain-gut connection. Um, we strongly believe and understand in our work that digestive imbalances and mental health go hand in hand. And so this presentation will focus on the brain-gut connection. Uh, if we balance digestive function, often uh, mental issues like depression or fatigue, other issues like arthritis, eczema, migraines, ADD, and many autoimmune illnesses also come into balance. So in this presentation, there'll be a focus on celiac and gluten intolerance, as well as irritable bowel syndrome, uh, some information on probiotics, and certainly information on healing foods. Uh, if you have not um, had the pleasure of um, joining a presentation with Dr. Lipsky, well, this is uh, a good one to join. But Dr. Lipsky is Director of Doctoral Studies and is Education Director here at Hawthorne University. She holds a doctorate in clinical nutrition and is board certified in both clinical nutrition and holistic nutrition. Liz has been in clinical practice for over 25 years and is the author of Digestive Wellness and Digestive Wellness for Children as well as Leaky Gut Syndrome. So welcome, Liz. We're excited to have you with us. Thanks, Paula. It's fun to be here and, and to be starting off the year. And I'm going to pick up somewhat where Marcel Pick ended last week because she was talking about infertility and all the different uh, connections there. And she did a really great program on how everything's interconnected. And I think this is a good follow-up to that, don't you? Yes, absolutely. Be kind of fun. So the topic today, as Paula was saying, is we're going to talk about how our brain and our gut are connected. And um, what some of you may or may not realize is that as nutrition counselors and people working in the field of nutrition, we can have a big impact on people who are depressed, anxious, and have a lot of other health conditions just by working with food and a few supplements, but even just with food. So um, I'm going to hopefully show you how important you are, all are so that um, you can figure it all out. Now, as nutrition counselors, one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to is what people eat. And that's the most important place to begin because food is our most intimate contact with our external environment and our external world. And every day we take in food and we say, I want to be just like you. And depending on what that food is, that's either a great idea or not such a good idea. So as nutrition professionals, we work a lot with what people can eat. And we're working on whole foods and organics and locally grown and fresh as much as possible. But people a lot of my clients, they eat all the right foods, but they can't digest them. And then when they get them into, the, into their bloodstream, they can't absorb them right. And then they can't get them to their cells. And then they're having a problem with either diarrhea or constipation or irritable bowel syndrome. So they're having problems excreting the waste. So tonight we're going to talk about some of the ways that we can help people to function better. And what's exciting to me is that the digestive system, we don't really think about it that much as long as it's working. But as soon as it's not working, all kinds of things get disrupted because the digestive system is more complex than just putting food in and waste out. It's um, muscular in that our mouth is a round muscle. and um, And there's muscles all the way down that push the food through and also open and close so that things don't go where they don't belong. For example, our ileocecal valve that's on the right side of our body in between our small intestine and our colon, it needs to close. Otherwise, um, garbage from the colon backs up into the small intestine, and that's not a good idea. It's also the digestive system is the heart of our immune system. And a lot of that is the 
small interface that's the, the one cell thick lining that, that lines the digestive system and has contact with our food. Um, and also our probiotic bacteria that we're going to talk about. It's neurological. We make more neurotransmitters in our gut than we do in our brain. And we have more um, nerve endings in our digestive system than we do in our spine. So it's complex that way as well. And also there's, it's hormonal because we have over 32 known hormones that are just inside of our digestive system. And then it's cardiovascular. For example, I just read a new study that came out that showed that if we just brush our teeth twice a day, we have a 70% reduced risk of having cardiovascular disease. And if we floss, it would be even more. And we know that the bacteria that are in our mouths, which is part of our digestive system, is also you know, really implicated with cardiovascular disease. And also the probiotics that are deeper down are also, they help regulate cholesterol levels and triglyceride levels and also help benefit us. And then also, all of our microbiome, which we're going to talk about shortly, um, is known to run our metabolism. So whether we burn hot or we burn cold or whether we gain weight or we don't gain weight has a lot to do with the probiotic bacteria and the balance of all the um, gut flora that are in our, in our body. So this picture is what the inside of a healthy digestive system looks like. This is the small intestine and you can see there are little finger-like projections. I've got my little pointer at one. And these little finger-like projections, what we can't see is that coming out of them are little tiny, tiny, um, smaller projections called the microvilli. These are the villi. And if we laid this all out flat, it would cover a surface about the size of a double tennis court or about 200 times the surface area of our skin. It's big. And what happens in a lot of people is that this gets flattened out. It almost gets to look like a bald tire, especially in people with celiac disease. And, um, and this is where the immune system lies. And these, are, these villi are single cells. It's only one level deep. And then these cells bring bring through the microvilli the nutrients that we need all the way into our bloodstream. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that might get compromised and how it might not work that well. We're going to focus on, um, I've been working in addition to teaching with Hawthorne, I've been blessed to be also working on a team um, at the Institute for Functional Medicine. And we've been looking at these different areas of um, digestion, and we call it the dig-in model. And um, it's, we start with, can somebody digest and absorb their food? If not, maybe they need hydrochloric acid or, or, um, or digestive enzymes, or maybe they need some bile salts. Do they have intestinal permeability, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. We also call that leaky gut. And this um, gut microbiota, which we're going to talk about, and dysbiosis, which is balances, and then inflammation and immune, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on. Because I really want to spend time on the nervous system, because the enteric nervous system is so, so important. Now, I already told you this, that we have more nerve endings in our gut than our spine, and that 95% of our serotonin is made in our gut. So when you start thinking about people who are depressed, they're often put on what we call SSRIs. And what those are is their serotonin uptake inhibitors. What they do is they keep the serotonin inside of that gut, um, neural synapse. The, the nerve cells don't actually touch each other. And what they do is that we stimulate them, and then they transmit these little drops of neurotransmitters, which in this case is serotonin. And then when it hits the next cell, it, trans it starts that one transmitting. And so drugs like Prozac and um, Paxil and so many others, what they do is they keep that serotonin in the cell longer. 
But you have to remember, 95% of the serotonin is made in our digestion. And what it's there for is to keep us having regular bowel movements and not having too much or too little. Otherwise, we end up with diarrhea or constipation. And not only serotonin is made there, but acetylcholine is made there, and dopamine, and um, virtually every single neurotransmitter is made in our digestion, our digestive system. And what they're made out of is amino acids. So if we can't digest the food pro proteins properly, then what happens is that we can't make neurotransmitters properly. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but if the pancreas isn't making enough digestive enzymes, or if that um, digestive uh, uh, in, inner lining of the gut is if those little microvilli are frayed in any way, then the chymotrypsin that's made there doesn't send information to the pancreas telling it to make more enzymes and release them. Also, if we don't have enough hydrochloric acid in our stomach, we're not going to break down protein as well either. And all of these things can result in people who are depressed and anxious and don't feel good. Um, we also can have um, neurotoxins that are made in the gut, and they create faulty signaling and cell signaling so that we, it, the gut thinks that it's inflamed, and it gives the wrong messages. And we know also that doing stress management techniques like biofeedback or acupuncture or doing um, uh, hypnosis or any kind of uh, stress release or tension release, even yoga or pranayama, can help reduce symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. So we know that there's this connection back and forth between the brain and the gut. Now, I don't mean for you to read this, actually, but these are different neurotransmitters that you find in the digestive system. And we've got GABA, which um, it's released in the central nervous system, but it relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter. So if people have too much GABA in, uh, or they don't have enough, they're going to have GERD. Um, norepinephrine, it decreases the motility or contraction of the sphincters. And so if you don't have enough, if you have too much norepinephrine, you'll have diarrhea. But if you don't, if you have just the right amount, then you know it slows things down. And then acetylcholine is just the opposite. It increases relaxation of the sphincters. So, and you, you don't want to have too much of that because you'll have diarrhea. So it's all about this balance. Um, serotonin we talked about. Um, uh, neurotensin, it, um, it's what allows the food to move from the stomach into the duodenum, which is the beginning of the small intestine. Nitric oxide regulates our blood flow and maintains our muscle tone and also allows the stomach to actually do its churning motion that it does to go so that it can mix all the food we eat. And then substance P is really stands for pain. And it, it gives us more awareness um, pain. So when that's really ramping up, we feel stomach cramps and we feel gas pains. And, and these are some of the neurotransmitters that are there. Now, the gut and the brain is a two-way access. And what I want to spend the next bunch of slides showing you is that this is a two-way process and that there are a lot of mental health disorders that go hand in hand with the digestive disorders. Um, in my own practice, mainly I see people who come to me because they have some kind of digestive issue, either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or, or um, irritable bowel or they've had parasites or whatever it is. And the amount of people who I see who are also on anti-anxiety drugs and antidepressants is really alarming to me. And so I see this two-way street all the time. Now, there, um, this our diagram published in Gastroenterology Insights in 2009. I really like it. It comes from a research group in Switzerland. And at the top, what you can see is that, um, that you start off right here 
kind of in the center top with behavioral changes. And the behavioral changes, like let's say I'm not sleeping at night. I've got insomnia and I'm not sleeping. Or I'm really nervous about getting my coursework done for Hawthorne. And so I, um, the behavioral changes, they send messages and information to my brain. And that brain says, ugh, I'm stressed in my gut. So how many times have you felt butterflies in your gut because you were nervous? Or how many times have you had the runs because you had to speak in front of a group or something like that? It's because our mind affects the way the gut is. And the reason is, is that when we're stressed, the digestive system mainly, not 100%, but mainly runs on what we call the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the relax, stop, rest, which is why in many cultures people take siestas after they eat and why when I was a kid they said we couldn't swim after we ate lunch and it's because, you know, you have to have this relaxation thing. So if we're stressed, we don't have a relaxed tummy, it changes the gut bacteria and we get a low-grade inflammation in our gut that can cause symptoms. On the other hand, we can start from a different place. We can start here with um, a bacterial infection in our gut, like candidiasis or a parasite or a bacterial infection. We could start with that, and it'll affect our brain, and it'll affect our behavior. And I have some slides on studies that are going to show you how that works. And, but also, the infection causes a low-grade inflammation to those villi and those microvilli, and then we get dysfunction in our gut and we get symptoms. So I wanted to show you some studies which I think are pretty interesting. The first one is um, was done in a clinic. They took 1,641 patients who had GI disorders, mostly small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is SIBO. Um, H. pylori, which is an infection that mostly causes ulcers, but also stomach cancer and, um, and uh, re gastric reflux disease, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, and depression, um, so, and anxiety. And they took consecutive patients for um, these seven years, eight years, and what they found was that 84.1% who had like chronic anxiety, 84.1% um, had, had chronic anxiety. And that was related to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, H. pylori, and ulcerative colitis mostly. 67% had periodic anxiety, which is called trait anxiety, that they anticipate that something's going to happen in their life and they get really anxious about it. And they found that that was mostly related to irritable bowel, which is mostly either constipation, diarrhea, um, abdominal pain or alternating diarrhea and constipation. And 27% of people were actually depressed and that was mostly related to celiac and irritable bowel syndrome. So they didn't kind of just pick, you know, say, oh, well, we'll only look at the anxious people who have GI disorders. They had a huge amount of people who were anxious and depressed. Then um, when you look, um, irritable bowel syndrome, depending on what studies you look at, affects between 10 and 20 percent of the adults in the U.S. and about somewhere around uh, 14 to 17 percent of our children and teens. And in children and teens, we call it recurring abdominal pain because they don't always have it exactly like adults do. Um, and 70 to 90 percent of people with irritable bowel um, have some kind of psychiatric issue, either a mood disorder or anxiety, as we saw in the earlier. 19% of people with I IBS um, are schizophrenic. Uh, or, or, uh, sorry, a 19, uh, in, of people with schizophrenia, 19% of them have irritable bowel. In people with major depression, 29% of them have irritable bowel. And in people with panic disorder, 46% have, irri have um, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, also, you see the same kind of patterns in people who have migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, depression. 
as well. And so you see the people who have fibromyalgia or depression or, or migraines have a 40 to 80 percent greater um, risk of having um, irritable bowel than other people. So you see that there's huge overlaps here. And um, the person who put together this diagram is Natasha uh, Campbell McBride, who is a MD who works out of um, London, uh, England, Great Britain somewhere. And she put this together. She's the one who put together what we call the GAPS diet, which is the gut and psychology syndrome diet. And what she's showing here is that whether you have eczema or asthma or attention deficit with hyperactivity or you have food allergies or allergies or autism or dyslexia or dyspraxia, which is that you can't speak, um, that there's a huge overlap, which is what the studies that I've been showing you indicate, that there's this kind of gut-brain connection here. Um, this is a slide that I put together from a bunch of different studies on the incidence of uh, digestive issues in children and adults with autism. And Helena showed that 91% of kids with um, autism had GI issues. Um, they took their siblings who didn't have autism, and only 25% of them had GI issues. And in their controls, none. Um, Ashwood and Andrew Wakefield did studies on enterocolitis which is actually where the, the villi and the microvilli have big, bald spots and inflammation. And 88% of children have that. And you can see incidence of esophagitis, which is an infl inflammation in the esophagus, abdominal pain, um, inflammation in the duodenum, chronic diarrhea, um, stomach inflammation, constipation, gas, abnormal bowel movements, all very high in autistic kids. And often, when you correct the digestive issues, you end up correcting a lot of the other um, mental and emotional issues. Then this slide is from the National Institutes of Health in 2008. They, uh, sorry, 2004. Sorry about that slide title. Um, and what they said uh, in their consensus statement on celiac is that celiac may be associated with an autoimmune and uh, endocrinologic disorder such as thyroiditis. And we see that with Hashimoto's um, um, thyroiditis uh, and Graves' disease sometimes too. In addition, a variety of neuropsychiatric conditions such as depression, anxiety, peripheral neuropathy, ataxia, which is uh, you can't walk right and you're dizzy, um, epilepsy, um, and migraines have all been reported. So again, this is the government saying this, the National Institutes of Health, as much as me. Um, and here's something about how you would diagnose celiac or gluten intolerance. And um, the main thing that we have that we can use is an elimination diet. And I think in some ways, it's the most accurate indicator of a gluten intolerance or celiac disease. Celiac is really a full-blown disease, but a lot of people have gluten intolerance and they have completely normal testing. There is a company called Entero Labs, and they do a test that looks for genetic testing to see if you have the right genes. But 40% of us have the right genes to have celiac. And we don't all get celiac um, because it's not as simple as that. There's also antibody testing. You can do um, IgA and IgG anti-gliadin, which would um, be indicative of a gluten intolerance, not necessarily celiac. IgA and Ig, um, IgA transglutaminase enzymes are really a great indicator for um, celiac. Um, and it's really kind of trans, uh, displacing the IgA endomycelial antibodies because it's much more specific. The gold standard is considered to be do a biopsy in the small intestine, but um, only probably one out of 10 to 15 people with celiac actually show it as digestive. The other big group show it as autoimmune diseases and um, neurological symptoms like we were discussing or even osteoporosis. So the main tool we have as nutrition counselors is to send people back to their doctors for testing and to use an elimination diet with people, which we'll go over shortly. So one of the things that I've learned recently that I just love is that 
is that we have genes that we're born with, and then we have an, our environment. And the overlapping place is really in the middle, which is what's called our phenotype. And according to Ali Fasano, who's one of the main celiac researchers in the world, he says that with, without something in our environment that causes us to have a leaky gut, we don't develop celiac disease. And from the research that I've read, I also don't believe we develop other autoimmune diseases. So let's talk a little bit about leaky gut. So leaky gut is a euphemism for, um, for when people don't have, um, they have molecules that are leaking through their gut. And you can see in this little movie, which I hope you can see, I think you can, that um, that not, the big molecules aren't getting through. Do you see? Did you see that? I think you Working did. Those, yeah. Okay. So, um, so in the next slide, what I'm going to show you is a leaky gut, and you can see that the the big molecules are sliding right through those gaps between the cells, and some of the small molecules are still getting through, and where they're all going is into our bloodstream. So if we get these large molecules that go into our bloodstream, our blood can't digest them. And there's nothing that the blood can actually do to, um, to break those down except have an immune reaction to them. Now, I want to just kind of show you that again, if I can. Um, because I want to show you what happens at the end. What you also start seeing is not only that the large molecules go through, but can you see how the little molecules, a lot of them, don't get through? And this is where we start to have malabsorption. Even the molecules that should come through don't come through. So for example, I have a client right now who's a woman who came to see me and she was only using a medical food called um, peptamin um, six to eight times a day with some frozen vegetables as the only foods that she could eat. And she was completely malnourished. But she had to do that to kind of break down the inflammation. And now what we've been doing is we've been adding bone broths and we've been eating, adding well-cooked food and she's been adding sea vegetables and, and also cultured vegetables to start building up that lining so that it's not so inflamed. Now here's another. This is a, a candida molecule. And you're going to see in just a second that it's going to slip right through. Did you see how that slipped through? And you can see those microvilli at the top of the screen. And those microvilli are, again, they're what are supposed to protect us from this candidiasis molecule go, slipping right through. And this is what we call leaky gut. When we have a leaky gut, we also have leaky brain and leaky skin. And so we might have depression or anxiety or ADD or schizophrenia. We might have eczema. We might have also asthma because we also end up with leaky lungs. And some of the symptoms that are really common, these are selected ones, but people get confused and memory issues. And people tell me their thinking is fuzzy. And they have mood swings. And they can get aggressive or nervous or anxious or just feel like they can't do anything. And then they also get all these food um, issues, like gas and bloating and eczema and psoriasis and food sensitivities and irritable bowel and indigestion and the other things that we've been talking about, like fibromyalgia and migraine. And so it's like if you see somebody and they come in to see you as a client or you're teaching a class and someone has irritable bowel syndrome and they also have asthma and they also have um, mental health issues, you know, rather than saying, wow, you should really go see a therapist and work on your health issues, maybe you want to start dealing with their GI before you do that. It's always good to send somebody to a, a, a therapist, though, um, and to a doctor if you're not sure what's going on. Um, so some of the, the supplements that I use the most is I love glutamine to heal up a leaky gut. And um, I have a question mark there because in children who have autism, sometimes you may not get the results that you're looking for. 
Um, but for most people, for everybody, glutamine is what the small intestine uses for energy, maintenance, and repair. Just like our brain runs on glucose, our small intestine runs on glutamine. And so I like to use glutamine in kind of large amounts, somewhere between one and three teaspoons daily mixed with a cool beverage. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to have somebody just mix it in with their, on their water bottle and then they can use that. I also sometimes will use quercetin dihydrate. I like using the PERC um, pain guard or repair guard for that um, because I think it, for me it, it seems to work better than other quercetin products. Gamma orizinol is something that you find in rice bran oil. So it's concentrated. You could also have somebody use some rice bran oil, um, which would also do the trick. Zinc is also, oops, Zinc is also very important for um, the health of the gut, and the, any zinc will work really well. I think about oysters as having more zinc than any food. There's about 150 milligrams of zinc in, in about three ounces of oysters. So it's uh, got more zinc than any other kind of uh, supplement and also has a lot of, of other gut healing uh, nutrients and peptides in it. Then there are fish peptides. They're called Sea Cure, and they're also really gut healing. Vitamin A, I wouldn't give indiscriminately, but I might have somebody eat liver or, cod, or calf liver or, or use cod liver oil or um, chicken liver, eat chicken livers for vitamin A or eggs. Um, marshmallow root is very soothing to the GI. Um, antioxidants like vitamin E and C and selenium, also very soothing. DGL is a deglycerized licorice that's also very soothing to the gut, slippery elm also. And sometimes I'll use digestive enzymes or aloe. And very often I'll use fish oils to help repair the gut um, levels of you know anywhere from one to three grams daily. We think about food, it's information. And we know that most people are not eating as well as they could, although when we ask people, how do you eat? They go, I eat pretty well. And then you look at their food diary and you see some of them do, but most of them don't. So you've got you know, pomegranates and tangelos and tangerines and coconuts and melons and blueberries or grapes. And you could either have that or you could have the jello mold that's also really colorful. Polyphenols are the colors in foods. And those foods are anti-inflammatory. So cherries and pomegranate and acai berries and, um, and blueberries and blackberries and raspberries and green peppers and, you know, all have really good polyphenols that reduce inflammation and, and legumes also. So this, so Liz, um, before you go back um, uh, on that picture, uh, you're saying you could also have the jello mold. You're not suggesting that the same nutrients could be garnished from the, from the jello mold as the as the whole food varieties on the left, are you? Well, it's got the same colors, Paula, so <laughs> I think. <laughs> so I think it probably has the same polyphenols. No, actually, those are made from coal tar dyes, from coal. And no, they don't have polyphenols. They just have um, petroleum derivatives that make them so pretty like that. So we can have information on the left, or we can have the information on the right. And we really don't want the information on the right. Thank you Not for clarifying that. Thanks. Sorry, I was kind of going fast there. So um, this study is an interesting one <clears throat> because it's from the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And what they say is that people who eat basically the standard American diet and, and the diet that's poor in natural antioxidants, so think, and fiber from fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and poor in omega-3 fatty acids may cause activation of the immune system most likely by producing a, um, excessive production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So these cytokines are things like NF-kappa-B um, and TNF-alpha and all kinds of things that our immune system goes in and says, wow, this shouldn't be here. And it starts causing inflammation so that our white blood cells can come in and deal with the problem. But if we're always eating a standard American diet, we're always going to have this kind of inflammation. 
and in fact, I, I didn't put it in here, but but um, I once had a a twelve year old girl who came to see me, and she said, "I go into anaphylactic shock if I have even one yellow M and M, one." And um, she said, I would be laying here on the floor gasping for breath if you gave me even one. And there was just a study done a couple of years ago that indicated that yellow dye increases inflammation by increasing these same inflammatory cytokines that the earlier study was talking about. Now, in some people, um, about 4% of people with schizophrenia and, and um, in um, in many children who have um, ADD and autism, um, pe people who ha are depressed, you get some foods, especially dairy products and, and gluten-containing grains like uh, wheat, spelt, kamu, rye, and barley. In some people, not everyone, turn into something that looks like an opiate in the brain. And when it does that, people start acting weird they start acting like they're on drugs. And um, when you take them off of these, they don't like it because they're addicted to the drugs because they actually feel pretty good because they've got morphine-like substances in their brain. It's like they were just uh, smoking coca leaves, you know? But um, when you take it away for a while, their brain clears. There's a man that I met named Daniel Hawthorne, and He's um, an adult, he's in his 40s, and he had um, autism all of his life. And as an adult, he, he read something online that said, you know, maybe if you don't eat gluten, maybe you'll feel better. And he remembered that when he was a child, his mom stopped giving him um, biscuits and started giving him potatoes. And within four days, he started talking. So he stopped eating all gluten-containing grains, and within by the end of the first day, his brain was starting to clear. And by the end of three days, he was like a completely different person. And I've worked with some people with schizophrenia or bipolar or um, kids with ADD, and it's not always a, a huge answer, but it often plays a role. So it's something to look for because food can be really inflammatory. And sometimes soy can do this, but mostly it's um, dairy products and gluten-containing grains. So we're going to talk about elimination diets in just a few minutes, but I want to talk about the gut microbiome. And I, what I want to talk about is when it's out of balance and when it's in balance. The gut microbiome, there's 10 times more cells in our gut that are bacterial and fungal and parasitic than there are cells in our body. And they comprise 99% of the DNA in our body. So we are either 10% either, um, uh, human or we're 1% human because the rest is really comprised by these, these bugs that, live, that cohabitate with us. And this human microbiome is in our nose, it's in our mouth, it's on our skin, it's in our GI, and it's in our um, vaginal system and in our bladder, and um, which is why these are places that we commonly get infections pretty easily. And what's not on here is the lungs, which should be. Um, I don't know why it's not there, but it should be, because we also have probiotic bacteria lining our lungs. The, by far, the hugest number of them are in our tummies. We have um, between three and a half and four and a half pounds. They're the size of our liver. And they're really like the rainforest. You know, if we go into the rainforest and we clear cut and plant genetically engineered soy, then it doesn't run as well. And what happens with us is when we're under stress, when we eat a standard American diet, when we take birth control pills or um, other hormones or steroids, when we take um, a lot of pain medications like aspirin or Tylen or Motrin or, or um, other pain relievers, we block the, the, um, the normal functioning of this human microbiome. And, um, and when we do that, then people um, have changes in their pain re receptors, people have faster and slower bowel movements, and there's all kinds of havoc that gets created. So in the early part of the 20th century, Ellie Metchnikoff 
was an MD who won a Nobel Prize in 1906 for his work on probiotics. And he was working with a probiotic called um, uh, uh, Bulgaricus. It's a... Uh, 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 I'm just trying to think of what the what the species of it is. Um, anyways, the Bulgaricus, which is one of the two main uh, probiotics that we find in yogurt. There's Bulgaricus and, thermoph and Streptomophilus. And um, he won a Nobel Prize, Prize for his work. And what he said over 100 years ago, what, and what's holding up to be absolutely true today, is that probiotics, which is the bulk of this microbiome, they're critical for us all, all through our life, but they're most critical when we're elderly and when we're babies. And when we're babies, what happens is the first three or four years of our life, we create this microbiome. And it pretty much stays stable our whole life. But if we go on even one week of antibiotics during the first three or four years of our life, we never fully recover from that. And I'm sure you can all think of some time when a, a small child might go on antibiotics for an ear infection, for strep. Um, and some children are put up on them over and over and over. And this sets us up for not having um, good immune function later in life. Because the main thing that the probiotics do for us is they make vitamins and nutrients, but mostly they modulate our immune system. Probiotics are strain specific. They're kind of like dogs. You know, you wouldn't send um, a chihuahua to chase a lion. You would send an Afghan to chase a lion. Um, you wouldn't send a pointer to go fishing for you because a pointer is good for duck hunting. And probiotics are the same way. We're starting to know more and more about them, although we're still really in our infancy in terms of what we know about which strain you should use for what. Like, for example, we know with irritable bowel syndrome that um, uh, bifidobacteria infantum um, works pretty well, and B. brev also works really well. Um, but there's a lot that we don't really know. And so mostly we're using kind of a shotgun approach. And what's interesting about these nutrients and these foods is that that people culturally always used to make homemade pickles and um, kimchi in Korea and sauerkraut in Europe and sourdough breads in Europe. And um, people would naturally culture on ferment foods. For a while, I did some consulting work with Danon. And um, Danon has over 3,000 3, different species of probiotic bacteria that they collected from kitchens all over Europe. And they're, they're one at a time trying to figure out what they're best at. And so we're going to see a lot more of targeted probiotic supplementation. But I think um, that the most important thing is probably to get good probiotics from food and also to get, if you're using supplements, use them that are mixed. Um, one thing that I didn't say yet is that when babies um, are born by C-section, they miss the opportunity of setting up their probiotic bacteria and their microbiome by not going through the vaginal birth canal. That birth canal does a great amount of trying to set up that immune system from the very moment the child's born. And also, when we breastfeed, um, babies are, um, uh, their immune system starts to mature more quickly, although bottle-fed babies catch up at about six months to a year. So it's not, um, it's not, you know, irreparable if a baby was just bottle fed. Um, as I said before, probiotics are nutritional. They increase our absorption of minerals like calcium and iron and magnesium. And they can help to minimize lactose intolerance because they break down lactose. Um, they're, they're almost like a lactase enzyme if you've ever used lactate. Well, probiotics can help do that. So for example, in cheeses or in yogurts or kefir, there isn't the amount of lactose that there is in milk. If I drink milk, you don't want to be around me. I don't want to be around me. But I can tolerate cheese or, or kefir or yogurt with no problem. Um, they help us digest proteins. They manufacture short-chain fatty acids, which keep our um, 
which keep our colon healthy, and they make vitam vitamins, virtually all of the B vitamins and biotin, and also um, vitamin K. Um, so then I started looking today to see if there was any research yet on probiotics for people who have depression or anxiety. And what they, this is one study um, medic, in Medical Hypothesis 2005. And what they hypothesize is that people who have major depressive disorders also have increased inflammation. They have increased oxidative stress. Um, they have altered gastrointestinal function and lower um, amounts of nutrients and omega-3 fatty acids. And they speculate that a lot of these people probably have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which I'm going to cover in just a second. Um, and what they found, they said, you know, probiotics modulate all those same things that people with major depressive disorder have. So maybe if we give people probiotics, their depression will improve and if we treat their small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And in fact, I have um, seen a lot of depression clear up. So this is a, another high, um, researcher named um, Desbonnet. And what she says is that the absence of probiotic bacteria in the gut can have adverse effects, not only locally in the gut, but also can um, affect the, um, hydro, uh, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and also monoaminergic activity, which is neurotransmitters, and features that have impl been implicated in the etiology of depression. So more recently, just in August of this year, she did a study. She's done about three of these, giving different types of probiotics. And what she does is these baby rats, she wants them to swim over water to their mother. And of course, these rats, they don't want to swim across the water. It makes them really anxious. And, um, and they don't want to do it. And when they give um, bifidobacteria, which is a probiotic, for 14 days, it normalizes their stress response, and they just go swim over to their moms. Um, their tryptophan levels normalize. Their adrenaline levels normalize. Um, all the stress normalizes. And so this is preliminary, obviously. But it's really interesting, because the research is beginning, beginning. Now, in this gut microbiome, um, we can have bacterial infections, and um, we can use different herbs and things to help combat those. Um, and one of those infections is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And this was a study done by Jeannie Drisco and Betty Bischoff. Um, at the University of Kansas that was published. And what they found was that when they checked people with, um, with uh, irritable bowel syndrome, they found dysbiosis in 100% of these people. And when they gave them probiotics, they improved. Um, and remember, you know, about 60 to 80% of people with irritable bowel syndrome also have depression or anxiety. So they also found, if by Pimentel and his group, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth was found in 78% of people with irritable bowel. And the same group also found the same 78% in people with um, fibromyalgia as well, and a smaller percentage with people with restless leg syndrome. So if you actually would treat small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, then you can make a lot of that distress go away. And just recently, I did. Um, an organic acid test on one of my clients who um, we first took off of gluten and she started improving, but she was still having a lot of irritable bowel syndrome symptoms. And her organic acid testing indicated that she might have um, a bacteria, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So I asked her to go to her doctor and see if her doctor would treat her for that with an uh, antibiotic called rifaximin. And within three days on the rifaximin, her gas, bloating, and discomfort were starting to go away. But also what was going away was all of her anxiety about food and anxiety about her life as well. And so um, the typical test that's used for this is actually a breath test where you drink some lactulose or mannitol, and then they measure the amount of hydrogen that you produce over a period of between one and two hours. 
and uh, we sh it's not us that produce the hydrogen, it's the bacteria. And then um, doctors like Mark Hyman, he just says, if you have gas, bloating, fibromyalgia, discomfort, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, restless leg syndrome, he would just go ahead and treat you. So we don't really have good ways of treating people other than giving them probiotics. And also, there is um, one good study on the use of peppermint oil that will um, that has a good effect on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And uh, right this moment, I don't remember. But generally, I send people to their doctors and ask them to be treated, because this is one place where um, this isn't nutrition. We're dealing with an infection, and this is not really in our domain. And I try to be, um, I cross some lines, but I try to be really careful not to practice medicine. Um, it's very important that if you think somebody has a medical problem, that you send them to a medical doctor. Um, we are not doctors, and it's very important that we always remember that. So I do a lot of referring to people back to their doctors for treatment. And I think I talked about most of these before, but um, these are gut healing substances, and at the bottom you'll see foods. So okra, um, slippery elm, cabbage, rice protein powder, um, our fish oils, or um, algal oils, or modified fats, or elimination diets, are all tools that we can use every day with people that will give us a really big bang for our buck. And so you also want to always give people um, with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you want to give them good probiotics. If they're on an antibiotic, you can use Saccharomyces boulardii because it's not a bacteria probiotic. It's actually a yeast. It's a cousin to bread yeast. And so it doesn't get killed when someone's on antibiotics. And it feeds lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. And also cultured dairy products, fermented and cultured foods, really good. Um, so, you know, most yogurts have anywhere from one to three billion microorganisms. It's not a huge amount, but if people make homemade yogurt, it might have up to 20, 100 billion organisms for, um, you know, six ounces. So having people make yogurt, it's so simple to make. You just take a tablespoon, you heat milk up to about 180 degrees, you let it cool down till it's lukewarm, um, about 120 degrees, a little warmer than Luke. You put in a tablespoon of yogurt, you mix it in, and you let it sit for 24 hours in a warm place. So if you have a pilot light on your oven, you can use that. Or I put it in a small cooler that I fill with warm water. Um, I know somebody who just sticks it in their jacuzzi on their way to work, and on their way home, they pull it out of the hot tub. Um, uh, you can also use a yogurt maker. I know that's what Paula does. and So it's really easy to make. Other probiotic-rich foods, and here's where, again, we come in, raw vinegars, homemade sausages, sourdoughs, um, root and ginger beers, fermented anything, really. Um, and then kefir, um, you can make coconut kefir, but here's two different commercial kefirs, and you can see that they have a lot of different types of probiotic bacteria in them. And I personally find that a lot of my clients can tolerate kefir better than yogurt, and I don't know why that is. I just know that it is. Um, in terms of supplements, you want to make the amount of probiotic you use uh, appropriate for who you're seeing. So if I'm working with somebody who's got diarrhea 10 times a day, I'm probably going to use Saccharomyces boulardii because there's great research on it. And I'll probably use 250 um, milligrams three or four times a day. <coughs> if I'm and just somebody who wants to maintain health, he might take between 3 and 20 billion organisms a day. And if somebody's got ulcerative colitis, there are studies using 3.6 trillion organisms a day. So you want to kind of vary it. You might, um, I don't think it matters whether you take it once a day or more than once a day. Um, I do like the refrigerated um, probiotics best. 
I do tend to like mixtures unless I'm using a specific probiotic for a specific reason. And the most in interesting thing about them is that there's new research showing that you can modulate the in immune system by using dead probiotics. So you, it doesn't have the GI benefits, but you can change uh, immune because the genes in those dead probiotic bacteria are still talking to your own genes. Um, and if you're not going to get your probiotics for food, from food and you're going to get supplements, I would highly recommend that you use um, uh, ones that are really good. Uh, Consumer Labs did, did a study recently of 19 products and five out of them failed, that they didn't even have at least one billion um, colony forming units of bacteria in them. Um, all of them were free from contamination but uh, they just didn't have much in them. So always look for a reputable company. Um, prebiotics are in foods, and they're fibers. And what they do is we take them in, and we use them, the probiotic bacteria in our colon, um, ferment them, uh, and they turn into food, like butyric acid, that helps heal, maintain, and give energy to the colon. And um, there are lots of foods that have these, including honey and green tea and maple syrup and peas and all the onion family foods, bananas, especially less ripe bananas, and all fruits and beans and burdock root, which is also called gobo root, So, um, and Jerusalem artichokes. So again, getting people to eat a variety of natural whole foods, you're going to give them prebiotics that feed the probiotics that that balance the gut microbiome. And in supplements, we mostly see inulin from Jerusalem artichoke or from chicory. Um, and we, we see something called fructilogosaccharides. It's also called FOS. And larch, arabinogalactin, is a great supplement that boosts immune system and also is also a, a prebiotic. There's all kinds of ways to do testing for food sensitivities, and I did a whole class on that, so you might want to look that up in the archives. But this is where we shine, is doing an elimination diet. And um, we might do a complete comprehensive elimination diet, or we might just eliminate gluten or eggs or, or um, dairy products, because we think those are the problems. Or we might put somebody on a candida diet, which is basically a low carbohydrate diet, or specific carbohydrate or GAPS diet, or um, in children, a low salicylate and low phenol diet. And like that woman I was telling you about before, an elemental diet, was, which is really where all you're doing is eating medical food. Um, and then fasting also changes symptoms. What I find is that most people, about 80%, respond to the least invasive type of diet. So it's one of the most effective medical tools we have, and this is in our domain. So um, we have not as many studies as I would like, but we see that elimination diets affect rheumatoid arthritis, irritable bowel, ulcerative colitis, um, Crohn's also, migraines, depression, MS, and, and especially type 1 diabetes. Um, and what I do is I let people have non-gluten-containing grains and fruits and all vegetables except for nightshades, although I'll let people have nightshades if they're not having joint problems. Um, they can have fish and poultry and um, lamb if they'd like or even beef if they'd like, herbs, spices, salt, pepper, honey, olive oil, ghee, coconut oil, they could even have to. And then um, if they're vegetarian, I let them have rice protein, um, and legumes if they want to do that. So um, also you could just remove the top 12, which is pretty much what I've done in the elimination diet. And then, um, or here's just removing the top two problem foods, the gluten and the, and the dairy. So here's a, a case study for you. This is a woman, really wonderful woman that I was working with, um, who came in and she said, I'm tired, I can't sleep. I've got acid reflux, I have gas, I have arthritis, I have hot flashes, and I don't feel well. You know, I've got fuzzy thinking, and I just don't really feel like myself. And so what we did was we did an elimination diet, 
And we also, this is um, an IgE and IgG food test for um, food sensitivities. And you can see up here, this is dairy. Can you see that all of the dairy is in the significant range? Egg white and egg yolk, they're both way up there. The gluten and gliadin, um, the malt, the wheat, the rye, they're medium, but I said, you know, we better not do those. So let's, right now we got rid of dairy, we got rid of eggs, we got rid of gluten-containing grains. Um, pineapple was medium, kidney beans were medium, and then there were more dairy products, again, all really up there. Navy beans were also up there, and pinto beans. So I said, you know what, I don't want you having beans or eggs or dairy or gluten. Um, and so we did this, and in two weeks, this is what she had to say. I've been wanting to update you on my progress. I got the, through the two-week elimination diet, and to be honest with you, I'm continuing pretty much on with this way of eating. I've totally gotten rid of my heartburn and acid reflux. My energy is back. I've stopped my hormones, no hot flashes. My joints are so much better. The best part, I also lost a little weight, too. This is how much we can do by just changing somebody's diet. And I have seen depression go away over and over and over by using an elimination diet. I had a woman, um, and for me, I have to say that depression seems most related to dairy in my experience. I, I mean, to gluten-containing grains in my experience. It just seems like uh, there may be other food sensitivities as well, but the biggies are usually gluten followed by dairy and eggs. Um, so we want to restore people with food. So we want to keep them on an elimin elimination diet. We may put them on a different special diet, either a yeast diet or GAPS diet or the body ecology diet for candida or Billy Crook's um, yeast connection diet um, uh, or the specific carbohydrate diet from Elaine Gottschall. And we have, I think pretty much we have um, classes on all of these. Um, so you want to put somebody on a diet. It is the most restorative thing. And if you feel confident, you can use some of the supplements that we've also talked about tonight. And then finally, you want to restore somebody. So after the healing, it's time to restore. We stop focusing on what's out of balance, and we, get, we begin nurturing. You know, so often what I'm doing with my clients these days is having them rest two hours a day during daylight hours and doing something, either sleeping or listening to music or doing some kind of a hobby that gives them joy or listening to birds or gardening, but just really doing something that feeds them and makes them feel like all is right with the world. Because if we don't take time to do that, the gut never heals. And then our mind also, also doesn't feel good. And so that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you tonight. So Paula, I'm sh I went really fast, so I'm sure that there's probably a few questions here. Thank you, Liz. A great presentation. And yeah, there's a few questions. And so I think I'll start backwards and move up, because um, to get to what you were speaking to uh, most recently. Um, and that was the lab company that you just showed for the case study. Um, there's a question, what lab company and panel did you use for the food intolerance panel? OK, well, I used different ones. This particular one happened to be um, Meridian Valley Labs. And I like them because they do both IgG and IgE. And they do 190 foods for $247. So I like it because it's really economical, and I get good, good clinical results with it. The problem with doing it is that it requires a blood draw. So it means that you need to send somebody back to their doctor and ask their doctor if they will um, allow them to, if they'll draw the blood. There are also Metametrics, US Biotech, now Meridian Valley Lab, and uh, uh, Metametrics, Metametrics, US Biotech. Meridian, I think those are all of them that I know of. They I all think do Diagnostics a, does as well. A, do a finger poke? Not a finger poke, no. Yeah, the, um, all of these companies do a finger poke. It's IgG only, which are delayed food sensitivities. Hmm. And then um, 
Uh, and then sometimes if I'm working with somebody with autoimmune disease, I might ask their doctor to order an ELISA ACT test, which not only does food, but does environmental contaminants too. And um, I think US Biotech also has one that, that works with foods. You know who else also has another really good one um, is uh, Great Plains Labs. Great Plains or, or, or Genova? Great Plains. Mm -hmm. Genova has one too. Theirs is a, a, blood, a blood draw. Yeah. It's also a good test, but you know, for the price, I like Meridian Valley Labs mm -hmm. better because you get mm -hmm. more food for less money. Um, there's a uh, request that you talk a little bit more about the modified fasting um, as well as the food combination to, to deal with the um, variety of conditions that you've been discussing. Okay. There's a huge amount of research on modified fasting or total fasting with water in rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and other autoimmune diseases because, as I said before, food is is the most inflammatory substance that we come in contact with every single day. And so there are many people, when they could just stop eating, they feel better because they're not fueling the inflammation. Um, typically, I don't like to take people back that far. I just like to take them off of the most inflammatory foods. And those are usually soy and wheat and dairy and eggs and sugar and alcohol and artificial, you know, substances, colorings and, and flavorings and preservatives and things. And so that's pretty much where I start. Um, you know, every once in a while, and I, I hope that you're not all going to get as first clients the people that I get, because I get people often, they're very debilitated, and we start with a medical food like Ultra Clear Sustain and applesauce and broths, and there are people that I have to start with, you know, they come to me and they're not eating anything really. And so we start with really easy to digest foods, broths that have chicken or fish in them that's been really well cooked, or brisket that's been really well cooked, or vegetables that are really well cooked, or vegetable juices that have been freshly made, or vegetable soups that are made in broth that's been pureed. So I mean, hopefully you're not going to get people that are that sick, but every once in a while you, you get people who are only on about three foods. It happens to me quite often, which I still like working with people who are pretty well, but it's really gradu grat uh, gratifying when you work with somebody who's really unwell and you start seeing them get well. I have Today I just got pictures of the woman who was on the peptamin, which is a prescription medical food, um, uh, which is the medical foods are free amino acids, free fatty acids, um, broken down sugars and carbohydrates and vitamins and minerals so that your body doesn't have to do anything to digest it at all. And sometimes you just got to go back there, um, but but hopefully not too often. Liz, um, can you talk a little bit about um, when you take away the fermented dairy yogurt in an elimination, um, uh, particularly with kind of uh, clients that you've been talking about, do you take it away and and reintroduce it as a challenge? I do. I usually try to keep dairy out for at least three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. It takes about 10 days to get it out of your body. And um, often people will feel queasy or they'll immediately get diarrhea or they won't feel good when they mm -hmm. reintroduce it. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to realize that dairy, that lactase enzymes, are secreted on the very tippy tops of the microvilli. And so if there's inflammation there or if there's any kind of a blunting of those microvilli, then you're not going to be able to make, you're not going to get those lactase enzymes and you're also not going to produce chymotrypsin, which signals the pancreas to, to start um, releasing enzymes. So. You know, pretty much if I was taking that away, I would have somebody making coconut kefir or buying coconut kefir or using a non-dairy non types of probiotics like um, cultured vegetables or coconut kefir or ghee or something like that.
So in this situation, um, uh, yogurt as well, because of yogurt it being a dairy well. product, even though it's cultured. Okay. Even though it's cultured, it still has some lactose, and some yes. people are reacting to the lactose, some people are re reacting to the casein. Yes. So I always take it away just to be sure. OK, just a couple more questions. Um, you said that glutamine isn't always um, indicated and doesn't always yield the best results for autism spectrum kids. Yeah. Um, is it actually counterindicated? Uh, or does it just not always work every time? OK, so here's the controversy about it. The controversy is that glutamine can potentially be made into glutamate, which is, um, which is a neurotoxin. It excites the mDNA receptor sites. And so it can be a brain toxin. And, um, and that's. That's possible because um, there's work that's shown that that the um, blood-brain barrier is not as impervious to penetration as we previously thought, and so it's possible that that could happen. So in the in the autism community, glutamine is kind of on the no 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 list. I happen to um, uh, have a friend named Doug Wilmore, who is the preeminent uh, glutamine researcher in the world. And believe me, I don't know that many important people, but he's one of them that I do know. And um, I asked him about this. And he said, you know, it, there's no mechanism for converting glutamine into glutamate in the brain. Um, it, the brain doesn't have the enzymes to do it. And we give really high dose glutamine to people in emergency rooms after brain trauma, after accidents, and um, when they're, you know, they've got a, acute brain inflammation, we give them 30 or 40 um, grams of glutamine a day, and it helps bring down the inflammation. He said, and we've never had any problems with, with um, increased glutamate levels. He said, I suppose it's possible. We've just never seen it. So in the glutamine, in the autism community, in the DAN community, it's kind of a no-no to use glutamine. But my perspective when I'm working with a child who's on the spectrum or an adult is let's try it and see what kind of result we get. And if the child's worse, then we won't keep using it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's certainly what I've experienced, too. And um, I, I, I think you've really addressed this, but part two of um, uh, uh, the student's question is the, about the potential effect of yogurt having opiate-shaped molecules, both uh, slowing the colon and also making their way into the bloodstream and potentially crossing the uh, blood-brain barrier. Yes, um, absolutely, they can. Yeah. Because what's, we're, what we're reacting to there is the casein. Right, yes. Um, you know, the casein in some children gets um, changed into a casomorphine, and it's not. It, it's it's so striking when you see it, isn't it, Paula? You take somebody off dairy and or gluten, or it, it's so striking because sometimes depression lifts. I had this one woman that I was working with, and she was so depressed. And we did an elimination diet, and really, the things that were her big bugaboos were sugar and gluten-containing grains. And she was re she rewarded herself one day with a piece of chocolate cake. And she was so depressed she couldn't get out of bed for three days. Yeah, hard reward, huh? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, you know to me, it's like you said, it can be you know, extremely dramatic. You know, when, when you find the food that's provoking the problem, um, it, it, it'll show up fairly quickly and uh, oftentimes be very dramatic in its, in its scope of the, uh, the way it's influencing the person's health. So it might have been depression, but you know, other things start feeling better, too, that they may not have um, I identified or correlated uh, with a problematic food. Yeah. So and last couple, you, yes, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I forgot. There's what a I was question saying. if you'd recommend a probiotic, if you had a specific probiotic that you recommend for um, children that have uh, autism. Um, OK, so uh, let me just kind of talk about probiotics that I like for everybody. 
So in the autism community, some of the products that are used that I, that I also agree I think are wonderful products are um, Kirkman makes products specifically for the autism community, um, but they also make wonderful probiotics. I also love Claire's probiotics, um, and I'll often use their Biotic Complete from Claire or um, one of their other probiotic strains for children and adults. Um, um, I also really like Metagenics makes some great products. Um, uh, Pharmax makes great products. Um, VSL3 is a really high-dose probiotic that's been used for people with ulcerative colitis and um, pretty severe um, GI distress, but you can use smaller doses and, and get a good result. Um, let's see. Um, I use um, transformation enzymes. I use their plantidophilus, which is a very low-dose probiotic for people who are intolerant to probiotics um, because they seem to tolerate it really well. Um, sometimes, personally, I will. I like to rotate my probiotics because I'm not taking them for any specific reason. So I'll use a couple bottles of one brand and then a couple bottles of another. So another kind of preventive probiotic that I might use would be um, the Perk Digesticard Forte. Um, I know that there's um, Udo's Choice makes some good probiotics. Um, Enzymatic Therapy makes a probiotic pearl that's pretty good. Um, uh, Natron yeah, makes excellent probiotics. Yeah, I think you went in a, in a really good order and ended okay. it with a really good one also, Natron. Um, yeah. So starting with the uh, top of the line. And is there anything that you recommend specifically for um, um, women that just had C-sections? Um, yes. For women who have just had C-sections, I would start taking, um, um, hopefully you're able to, to nurse. And so for those women, if they can nurse, I would recommend both you and the baby taking um, uh, some Bifidus Infantis, and there are several companies, uh, Douglas Labs and also Natrin and uh, I think uh, Pharmax, they all make um, infant formulas that are mostly Bifidobacteria Infantum, which is what the babies have is their main probiotic bacteria for the first two to four months, and then they start developing more lactobacilli. So for both of you to be taking that, and how you do it for a baby is either just take a pinch and put it on their tongue or just dip your, bo your finger in the bottle and just whatever is on your finger, let your baby suck your finger. Um, you can also put it on your nipples. And um, for you to take like, I don't know, a quarter to a, a quarter teaspoon once a day. Um, and also for women who just had C-sections, you could also take, you know, other probiotics that are more specific to you. Mm -hmm. as well. It doesn't hurt babies to have any of the other ones we talked about, too. Studies are pretty interesting showing that babies who get probiotics from birth um, at the age of two and five have less eczema, less, less asthma, um, and less allergy all the way around. And, you know, those kids are being followed, and it'll be really interesting to see what happens when those kids are 18 or 45 as well. It will. I want to thank you so much, Liz. It's been a, a very informative presentation. Um, thanks for hanging through the um, questions and answers. I want to let everybody know that we have um, altered the webinar schedule slightly. Uh, you'll see it in the webinar announcements that come out. We are doing webinars on the first and third Tuesday of the month, and we are starting them at 4 p.m. Pacific time. And the presentation will be approximately an hour. And then we will have post-presentation open discussion period for about 15 minutes or so. Um, so if anybody that's on the line um, today would like to stay with me and have open discussion about this topic, uh, you're, you're welcome. Please join me. And in two weeks, that puts us at September 21st. Um, our next presenter is Patty Lerner. She'll have a fantastic presentation. Oh, the topic will be total load. So we'll be talking about what the body burden is, what we're all carrying in us based on what we're eating and our environmental influences are and the consequences of that. 
So we hope we uh, you can join us again for for that presentation. And um, thank you again, Liz. I really uh, appreciate the time that you spent with us and your expertise. And I want to thank you all for joining uh, and, and wish you all the best of health. Thanks, Paula. It was a pleasure.